Hi everyone, thank you for joining me. This is Insight into Wellness. And today I'm interviewing Miho Hananaka. And Miho is a registered dietitian nutritionist and a mind, body, and eating coach. She guides people with stress and emotional eating habits who are not feeling comfortable in their own skin and helps them break free from their diet prison. She's helping busy professionals who struggle to eat right using her mindful eating strategy. And I really wanted her to come on today and talk to you, parents, about what you can do to eat mindfully. Thanks for joining, Mio. Hi. Hi. Thank you for inviting me. I am so excited. Yeah. Well, you know, we met at our co-working space here in Portland and just kind of got along really... Yeah, it's been a while. Yeah. yeah. And I really love what you're offering and what you do. And I was hoping you could just start with giving us a good definition of what it is to be um, a mind eating coach and a dietitian and where you find yourself landing. Oh, yeah, it's totally a two different path that I've been kind of trying to merge. So originally I was a registered dietitian. Well, I am a registered dietitian. And so to become a registered dietitian is more conventional you go to four-year college and you have a one year of clinical internship to be a registered dietitian and my training was in clinical nutrition so treating people um, who are struggling with diabetes and other chronic diseases hypertension and whatnot because I was uh, a clinical nutritionist but with my own health and weight struggles in the past, I was really, I've been really interested into a weight loss and body confidence. And then I realized that being a registered dietitian was more conventional calorie counting and calorie restricting. And that was very limiting to the people who are trying to lose weight or to be more confident in their body. And that's how I had my own personal um, experience as well. I dieted before, I had a lack of body confidence in, in the past, and I follow many diets and conventional you know, calorie counting, restricting. And then I realized it didn't work for me. And towards my end of weight struggles and body confidence struggles i found out about mindful eating and that was just a, a perfect match between the balanced nutrition and the mindfulness and i realized that it's more sustainable for your body and oh yeah so so then i wanted to get more education on mindful eating so i could um, I took a course from the Institute of Psychology of Eating, and I just got my certification two months ago. Congratulations. <laughs> my body eating coach. Yeah. That's really important. And I also talk a lot about the mind-body connection. And when we really want to start, you know, losing weight or paying attention to the body or gaining weight or working through those challenges, it takes not just actively and physically doing things, but also working with the mind. Right. Yeah. When you yourself, because you've expressed that you had your own challenges, when you, and maybe now you feel much better, you're more mindful, you're obviously offering this to a lot of people. What are your practices that you use when you come up against the challenges in your life, whether they be, you know, near or far? Mm-hmm. Yeah, definitely. For from my own personal experience and what I've experienced in the past when I was struggling with uh, weight struggles, it's it was always a constant battle against my willpower. Mm. <laughs> and I see all a lot of my clients who struggle with lack of what we call the willpower. But from learning about mindfulness, it's not at all about your willpower no and you know what i've seen so many successful people who are single mothers and full-time working 
full time and then they have so much willpower into their for their family for their financial life but then they always struggle with lack of willpower in food. So I've been investigating and trying to study why is that so, and I realized that it's because, how can I frame it? People are so caught up with other things in life and the food became so secondary that it's just people are just pushing food and nutrition aside. But at the same time, if you don't have your health aligned, you can't do all the things that you do that you that keep keeping you busy. Yeah. And, yeah. So so then the, the big thing I teach for my clients is slowing down, especially when you're eating. Just to hit on that note, just about, you know, a lot of my listeners are parents and they're constantly going from one thing to the next thing yeah. and slowing down seems like the last thing that's available. Yeah. Yeah. When you speak to your clients about that slowdown, because when we talk about holistic care, when as an mm -hmm. Ayurvedic practitioner or someone who is looking and developing mindful eating habits, when we talk about that, it's so, it's, it's an easy way to just say, oh, just be more yeah. mindful. But that mm -hmm. piece is so hard. It is hard. Yeah. Simple ideas. Uh -huh. What we think of as the biggest challenge. Right. Yeah, it is very hard. So what I suggest my clients is really baby steps. And a lot of people, they don't, because they're so busy with other things in life and their life, they don't even take time to eat breakfast. They don't need time to eat lunch. And they are just running on these, what we call empty calories in the nutrition field. Um, you know, high sugar, high carbohydrate snacks, and those are not giving you much energy. And I realized if you, it's definitely, it's, it's really hard for especially parents because you know, especially as a parent, your child comes first. Yeah. Um, and definitely it's, 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 it's totally understandable and, you know, it's natural at the same time. If you, if you don't take care of yourself, um, how, how can you, how can you raise a healthy child, right? This is the <laughs> challenge. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there's so many sayings, like you have to fill your own tank before you can help others. You have to put on your own mask before you help others. Mm. This is a common thread throughout a lot of um, our society, and yet still food and eating mindfully and slowing down is not a big part of it. Yeah, yeah. And at the same time, I, I've had a, a client who was a single mother and she was very running around, you know, doing everything to provide for her, her child. And one thing we came up with is that her, her son actually really was really interested in nutrition. So I, I suggested, and she's been doing, what she's been doing is on Sundays, they cook their own breakfast together. Yeah, bringing in the family. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there is always a way to bring in the family and, you know, making time together with as a family as well. Yeah, um, you're, you have Japanese background, you speak a lot about, well, I was listening to your interview with Seishan, who is another mm -hmm. one I interviewed actually as well, yes. and you talk about, you know, the culture of Japan and the food and really how when you were in school, there was mm -hmm. beautiful portions of nutritious food. Mm -hmm. Do you think you take that culture and now you're here in America, you've been here for quite a long time. 
how do you still find that culture within your daily life and how does that food play into that? I guess it just becomes, since the food culture in Japan was so significant for me, especially in in school in Japan, they there was in my at least in my school there was a, a registered dietitian on staff, and there was a, a full production kitchen that made hot food every day, just balanced meal every day, mm-hmm. and the food, the nutrition was part of their education, and since I was brought that way, raised that way it's just kind of ingrained into my my blood <laughs> so it's not as hard as um yeah it's not as hard for me to bring in it it kind of my body kind of creates it that bringing in the Japanese flavor your how would you offer to listeners ideas to include some of this really educate this education around nutrition mm-hmm from you know this Japanese culture and how you utilized it in your life how can you see like American culture meshing with Japanese culture in terms yeah, of that's why I'm trying to figure it out actually <laughs> yeah I would love to see and unfortunately the public school especially in the public school in the U.S. they don't offer a solid nutrition education so a lot of nutrition education uh, would have to come from family or parents. And I think it will be a great opportunity for the family to really get involved with nutrition, um, having a balanced diet and learning how to cook. And yeah, I've I'm learning about where the food comes from as well. Yeah, I, I try to do, um, I try to continue to do what I like to call interviews with parents so I can make sure that mm-hmm. I'm in alignment with my thoughts and my thinking because a lot of my work with parents comes from the perspective of the child and my childhood and what it was mm-hmm. like to live with a parent who wasn't paying attention to their health care and their and when our parents can really dive in and focus on themselves and invite the family mm-hmm. to create these events, or I call them rituals, to have more family come together and create. I, I think yeah. it starts from the family and mm-hmm. teaching our kids how to, how to take charge and learn and have fun in the kitchen. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Oh, and one of, one of the things that I caution parents is really understand and observe what your bias is Mm. and not even just you know when if you are a parent and you follow a raw food diet I'm not saying it's don't teach that to your kids but at the same time understand um, where they're standing at your your kids are standing at their you know the the timeline in their nutrition and in, in their growth um and in my in my experience i i was thinking about this and my my mom doesn't like mushrooms mm-hmm. <laughs> and i realized i never had and she never served mushroom dish until i was at home Mm. And I never knew how mushroom tasted so good until I was in college. <laughs> wow. So many years nests of mushrooms. Yeah. <laughs> and so it's just a very interesting at the same time. You know, I don't like shrimp. And I realized that I don't serve shrimp at home. And it, it's just so interesting how your taste kind of forms into, I wouldn't say it's a bad biases, but at the same time, if you're teaching children, you want to be aware of that as well. It's an important, important piece. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm, I heard in your interview with Seishan that there's there good food and bad food, and that you actually don't like to call food bad food. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. 
when, I'm not a fan. <laughs> when does, is there a bad, like, is there for you when you talk about this, is there, okay, well, if you eat so many things of this, mm -hmm. not as nutritional thing, then it turns bad? Or do you just always stick away from good and bad foods? I just don't label food good and bad because it just depends on personal, on, on that person. Um, for me, shrimp is a bad food for me because my body doesn't like it. <laughs> yeah. But at the same time, shrimp is a perfect protein and nutritious food. So I, I don't label that food as bad. And at the same time, people talk about all these refined carbs and sugary food, sugary drinks. Definitely, if you go overboard, it's, it's bad. Mm -hmm. And I, I strongly suggest and teach about whole food nutrition, meaning cooking food from scratch as much as possible. But often I suggest people with, especially with children or parents, I would suggest some packaged food just because of the convenience. And it's rather, you'd rather have something to eat than not eat anything for lunch. And that's the bottom line. It's just yeah. And if you start, yeah, if you start labeling good food good and bad, it just becomes a whole rabbit hole. And especially if you label foods bad, it just becomes very stressful for your body and your mind too. Because you're constantly watching out for those bad food and I can't touch that bad food. But at the same time, these food are trigger food. For me, in my experience, and I see in my clients who struggle, especially with weight, they label chocolates are bad. But at the same time, if they constantly thinking and brainwashing themselves, chocolates are bad, chocolates are bad. It just puts so much stress on your body without knowing it. Yeah. And all of a sudden, one day you had a very stressful day and you go on a chocolate binge. And it's just not sustainable for, for your body. I would rather have you have a little piece of chocolate every day than just restricting yourself from bad food and binging on and getting, regretting your actions, right? And this comes back to the idea of taking baby steps. So yes, you know, take a bite of chocolate if that's going to be something that calms the mind and lets your body just relax. And then there'll be days where you'll have spaces. Okay, well maybe it's a piece of chocolate every three days or, you know, expanding on that. And baby steps, so important. Yeah, yeah. I had a beautiful story with one of my clients. She used to binge on a tub of chocolate ice cream every night in front of TV. And I suggested her not to stop doing that, but eat without watching TV and slow it down. And after a couple of months, she realized that her ice cream that she used to eat every day it doesn't taste good anymore. Wow. wow. Yeah. So another thing is the distracted eating. A lot of people are multitasking and um, eating in front of computers, in front of TV, while running, chasing after kids. And it's, it's really hard for parents, but having a, a time to really, even just one bite, sit down and have a bite and really taste the food. Mm -hmm. And that's that's a start for a lot of busy parents, busy professionals. That's an even that that love that baby step. Sit down, mm -hmm. have a few bites, and then okay, you want to get up, watch the iPad, or read the book mm -hmm. where you're drawing. Or you know, Ayurveda talks a lot about this, especially when we are trying to settle the mind and not create ama, 
which is mm -hmm. toxicity in the body or the mind. But when we aren't able to sit down and process our food and process this moment, yeah, a lot of different things are happening in the body that might not be in our Right. Yeah. Yeah. I always tell my clients, you know, people say don't text and drive. Yeah. So I always say don't text and eat. I love that. Because there is a, there is a, a reason why people say don't text and drive, right? Because you are, your phone is taking all your attention and you're not attentive on, on the road and what's happening to you. And it, can potentially cause a really big damage. And it's the same thing with eating too. If you are texting while eating and being distracted while eating your body, you're not attentive for your body. Yeah. Um, I want to kind of slide into the idea, the more the coaching aspect behind, you know, thinking, thinking mindfully and working mindfully. And when, um, when parents or your, any client, when anyone comes to you, mm -hmm. um, there's a lot of judgment on the self. There's a lot of self judgment, a lot of what you were saying yeah. earlier with your client, where, mm -hmm. um, you know, you associate a specific food with it being bad. And then when you eat that food, because you had a stressful day, yes. that situation is then put literally inside of you. And then judgment starts happening and possibly shame. Mm -hmm. How do you counsel and your thoughts around that? Yeah, yeah, that is a great question. And that's one of the bigger part of what I do of my work is self-judgment. And it's just, I tell my clients, don't judge yourself. <laughs> and with, with my coaching, I don't judge my clients at all. Even they eat a tub of ice cream every day. Fine, it's it's normal. And you know, you're taking action. You're actually seeing me and taking action, being proactive on improving your health and implementing something better and something healthier for you. And it definitely judgments, it it depends on where that comes from. Is it judgment from a lot of the time people struggle with a past experience on if you were bullied at school because you were overweight? That is just becomes internalized in your body or in, in your mind that you just constantly judge yourself because somebody else at school told you you should be some, some, someone different. Yeah. And that happens a lot with parents. Um, uh, if you are judging yourself, often you might be subtly judging your, your kids. I've seen that as well. And it just becomes a vicious cycle. And you might not be aware of it. And, and especially if you have younger kids around and you, they see your, you as a, as a parent judging yourself, and you're just telling your, your kids that mom, your mom, your mom is not good enough because I'm overweight or because whatever. And then it just kind of plants the seed in your kids that, okay, like this is something that you're implanting their ideal perfect body that my mom never got. Yeah. That really actually hits close to home. And, mm -hmm. you know, I think this bringing this conversation full circle, I think a really big takeaway is that we need to be honest with ourselves. We need to be honest with our children. Mm -hmm. And when we do start working our way through eating mindfully or healing or whatever it is that you're working through, that you mm -hmm. have a piece of family where you do it with help or you do it with assistance and you take those baby steps. That's very Definitely. much important. Yeah. Well, the small baby steps. Yeah. It's all, it's all just a journey. 
And I wanted to thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you. Do you have a way for people to connect with you? If you would like to shout out any links, and then also I will be posting all of this afterwards. Oh, great. Yeah, so the best way to reach me is through my website, zenintegrativenutrition.com. I know the link, the URL is very long. So if you have any ideas on shorter link, <laughs> let me know. I've been going on, um, I've been trying to refresh my website. So yeah. So there will be a lot of, I'm, I'm planning to put a, a free guides and more blogs and articles about mindful eating, how you can implement uh, mindful eating and how you can overcome your lack of willpower <laughs> with food. Oh, yeah. Third chakra. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And also Instagram is might be the easiest way to access me, mindful Nico at mindful Nico. Great. Thank you so much. And if you would like to listen to this or more, you can go to greentreeayurveda.com and sign up for my newsletter where I share helpful tips, Ayurvedic wisdom, and more. You also can get a free gift. I have an offering of an Ayurvedic spices to know and use. So when you're working through you're eating mindfully. You can also be working on your digestion as well with beautiful spices and herbs that will assist yeah. in your digestion. And if you are in the community and have questions or you are a holistic leader, I would love to speak with you. You can go to or you can send me a message at hello at greentreeayurveda.com. Thank you so much for listening.